Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part 20 of Dr. R. Swinburne Clymer's Ancient Mystic Oriental Masonry. 324 There is a tradition of St. John the Baptist which has collateral evidence to sustain it. His father and mother died during his minority and he was adopted by the Essenes, lived with them in the wilderness, and when a proper age he was initiated into their mysteries and finally arrived to the chief dignity of the order. His diet and manner of living was perfectly comfortable to the rules of the Essenes. They lived in the country, so did he. They dwelt near the river Jordan and baptized their disciples. John did the same and thus acquired the cognomen of the Baptist. The Essenes fed on dates and other fruits and in many other respects agreed with the character of John as we find him in the Gospels. 325 The fact that each St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist were eminent Essenes is a sufficient reason why, in later times, Masons should dedicate their lodges to them without looking for or assigning any others, although doubtless our ancient brethren had other reasons. 326. Masonic monitors say, and since the time of St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist, there is represented in every regular and well-governed lodge a certain point within a circle, and bordered by two perpendicular parallel lines representing St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist, and upon the top rests the Holy Scriptures. 327 the two parallel lines, which in modern lectures are said to represent St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist, really allude to particular periods in the sun's annual course. At two particular points in this course, the sun is found on the zodiacal signs, Cancer and Capricorn, which are designated as the summer and winter solstices. When the sun is in these points, he has reached his greatest northern and southern limits. These points, if we suppose the circle to represent the sun's annual course, will be indicated by the points where the parallel lines touch the circle. 328 The mysteries among the Chinese and Japanese came from India and had similar rites. The equilateral triangle was one of their symbols and so was the mystical Y, both alluding to the triune god and the latter being the ineffable name of deity, and for which symbol the modern masons have substituted the 47 problem of Euclid from its similarity in shape, having lost the explanation of their original symbol. A ring supported by two serpents was emblematical of the world protected by the power and wisdom of the creator, and that is the origin of the two parallel lines into which time has changed the two serpents that support the circle in our lodges. 329. In the druidical rites, the point within the circle and the cube were emblems of Odin, the supreme god, the author of everything that existed, the eternal, the ancient and living, and awful being, the searcher into concealed things, the being that never changeth. 330. The point within became a universal emblem to denote the temple of the deity and was referred to the planetary circle in the center of which was fixed the sun as the universal god and father of nature. For the whole circle of heaven was called God, it was believed that the center of a temple was the peculiar residence of the deity, the exterior decorations being merely ornamental. Mexico, Britain, Egypt, India, etc. present us many remains of temples built in secular form, in the center of which still remains the point or emblems of divinity. 331. All nations recognized as an object of worship a great supreme deity by whom all that was, was made. Another idea was that nothing possessing life could be created without the conjunction of the active and passive generative powers. And as God created all life, 
he must necessarily possess within himself each of these powers, and hence the phallic worship so common among the ancient nations, the symbol of which was the emblem that we have had been considering and which is found in connection in the monuments of antiquity everywhere. 332. The point within a circle is derived from the ancient sun worship and is in reality of phallic origin. It is a symbol of the universe, the sun being represented by the point, while the circumference is the universe. 333. The point within a circle is an interesting and important symbol in Freemasonry, but it has been so debased in the interpretation of it in the modern lectures that the sooner that interpretation is forgotten by the Masonic student, the better will it be. The symbol is really a beautiful but somewhat obtruse allusion to the old sun worship and introduces us for the first time to that modification of it known among the ancients as the worship of the Phalus. 334 Perfectly to understand this symbol, I must refer, as a preliminary matter, to the worship of the Phalus, a peculiar modification of sun worship which prevailed to a great extent among the nations of antiquity. 335 The Phalus was a sculptured representation of the membrum viral, or male organ of generation, and the worship of it is said to have originated in Egypt, where, after the murder of Osiris by Typhon, which is symbolically to be explained as the destruction or deprivation of the sun's light by night, Isis, his wife or the symbol of nature, in search for his mutilated body, is said to have found all the parts except the organs of generation, which myth is simply symbolic of the fact that the sun having sat, its fecundating and invigorating power has ceased. The phallus, therefore, as the symbol of the male generative principle, was very universally venerated among the ancients as a religious rite without the slightest reference to any impure or lascivious application. He is supposed, by some commentators, to be the god mentioned under the name Baal Peor in the Book of Numbers as having been worshipped by the idolatrous Moabites. Among the eastern nations of India, the same symbol was prevalent under the name Ling Am, but the Phallus or Ling Am was a representative of the male principle only. To perfect the circle of generation, it is necessary to advance one step further. Accordingly, we find the Cetes of the Greeks and the Yoni of the Indians, a symbol of the female generative principle or coextensive prevalence with the Phallus. The Cetes was a secular and conclave pedestal or receptacle on which the Phallus or column rested and from the center of which it sprang. 336. The union of the Phallus and Cetes, or the Ling Am and Yoni, in one composite figure, as an object of adoration, was the most usual mode of representation. This was in strict accordance with the whole system of ancient mythology, which was founded upon a worship of the prolific powers of nature. All the deities of pagan antiquity, however numerous they may be, can easily be reduced to two different forms of the generative principle, the active or male and the passive or female. Hence, the gods were always arranged in pairs as Jupiter and Juno, Bacchus and Venus, Osiris and Isis, Christ and Mary. 337. But the ancients went further, believing that the procreative and productive principles of nature might be conceived to exist in the same individual. They made the odor of their deities hermaphrodite and used the term man-virgin to denote the union of the two sexes in the same divine person. 338. Now this hermaphroditism of the supreme deity was again supposed to be represented by the sun, which was the male generative energy, and by nature or the universe, which was the female prolific principle, and this union was symbolized in different ways, but principally by the point within the circle. The point indicated the sun, and the circle the universe, invigorated and fertilized by his generative rays. 339. 
So far, then we arrive at the true interpretation of the Masonic symbolism of the point within the circle. It is the same thing, but under different form, as the Master and Wardens of a Lodge. The Master and Warden are symbols of the Sun, the Lodge of the Universe or World, just as the point is the symbol of the same Sun and the surrounding circle of the Universe. 340, but the two perpendicular parallel lines remain to be explained. Everyone is familiar with the very recent interpretation that they represent the two Saints John, the Baptist and the Evangelist, but this modern exposition must be abandoned if we desire to obtain the true ancient signification. 341. A New Zealand myth says we have two primeval ancestors, a father and a mother. They are Renga and Papa, heaven and earth. The earth out of which all things are produced is our mother. The protecting and overruling heaven is our father. 342. It is thus evident that the doctrine of the reciprocal principles of nature, or nature active and passive, male and female, was recognized in nearly all the primitive religious systems of the old as well as of the new world, and none more clearly than in those of Central America, thus proving not only the wide extent of the doctrine, but also a separate and independent origin, springing from these innate principles which are common to human nature in all climes and races, hence the almost universal reverence paid to the images of the sexual parts, as they were regarded as symbols and types of the generative and productive principles in nature, and of those gods and goddesses who were the representatives of the same principles. The first doctrine to be taught, men would have relation to their being. The existence of a creator could be illustrated by a potter at the will, but there was a much more expressive form familiar to them, indicative of cause and effect in the production of births in tribes or in nature. In this way, the phallus became the exponent of creative power, and though to our eyes vulgar and indecent, bore no improper meaning to the simple ancient worshipper. Bonwick Egyptian Belief, page 257. The phallus and Katis, the lingam and the yoni, the special parts contributing to generation and production, becoming thus symbols of those active and passive causes, could not fail to become objects of reverence and worship. The union of the two symbolized the creative energy of all nature, for almost all primitive religion consisted in reverence and worship paid to nature and its operation. 343. In those days, all the operations of nature were consecrated to some divinity from whom they were supposed to emanate. Thus, sowing of the seed was presided over by Ceres. He by a rights, general for long, is equivalent to Zolife, from the Greek to live, thus what is called the fall, ascribed to Eva or Heva, the female, and Adam the male, becomes in reality the acts connected with generation, conception, and production, and the destruction of virginity. Adam fell from listening to Eve, and she from the serpent tempting her. Details which merely assure us that we have procreated acts, and all stories regarding Hawa, which is in Hindustani, lust, wind, air, Juno, and Hava or Eve, or as the Arabs call it, Hayat, life or creation, eating forbidden fruit was simply a figurative mode of expressing the performance of the act necessary for the perpetuation of the human race. 344. This sacred festival does not astonish me, says Dr. Goodman. I feel persuaded that this was the first festival that man celebrated, and I do not see why we should not pray to God when we are going to procreate a being in his image as we pray before we take food, which serves to support our body. Working to give birth to a reasonable being is a most noble and holy action, as thus the first Indians thought who revered the lingam, the symbol of generation, the ancient Egyptians. Egyptians who carried the phallus in procession, the Greeks who erected temples to Priapus. 345. 
the reverence as well as the worship paid to the Phalus in early primitive days had nothing in it in which partook of indecency. All ideas connected with it were of a reverential and religious kind. When Abraham, as mentioned in Genesis, in asking his servant to take a solemn oath, makes him lay his hand on his parts of generation, which in the common version says under his thigh. It was that he required, as a token of his sincerity, his placing his hand on the most revered part of his body, as at the present day a man would place his hand on his heart, in order to evince his sincerity. Jacob, when dying, makes his son Joseph perform the same act. A similar custom is still retained among the Arabs at the present day. An Arab, in taking a solemn oath, will place his hand on his virile member in attestation of sincerity. 346. The indecent ideas attached to the representation of the Phalus were, though it seems a paradox to say so, the result of a more advanced civilization towards its decline, as we have evidenced at Rome and Pompeii. 347. Our ideals of propriety leads us to suppose that a ceremony which appears to us infamous could only be invented by licentiousness. But it is impossible to believe that licentiousness and depravity of manners would ha ever have led among any people to the establishment of religious ceremonies. Profligacy may have crept in in the lapse of time, but the original institution was always innocent and free from it. The early agapes in which boys and girls kissed one another, modestly on the mouth, degenerated at last into secret meetings and licentiousness. It is, therefore, probable that this custom was first introduced in times of simplicity, that the first thought was to honor the deity in the symbol of life which it has given us. 348. To sum up, the Phalus, in the same manner as statues, plants, animals, objects of worship among nations, was only the outward covering the receptacle, the vehicle of the deity which was supposed to be contained within it, a deity to which alone religious worship was paid. This outward covering, this receptacle, this vehicle was buried in an infinity of modes with regard to its form, but it was neither a symbol nor an allegory. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the links below. Thank you so very much.